Greetings, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I have John Noonan on as a guest. John is an SNC coach. I'm not going to read out his full bio because he has 15 years of working in elite sport uh, in a lot of different sports and organizations with different athletes. And um, here's a flavor of a few of them. He's worked with Chelsea Football Club, Everton Football Club, Huddersfield Giants Rugby League team. He's worked with Olympic athletes in skiing and snowboarding. He's worked with a ton of corporate clients, private athletes professionally, semi-professionally. Um, and he's worked in motor racing more recently and continues to in Formula 3 and Formula 2. Um, he's actually going to take me, he's going to go to the top of the motor racing world and he's going to take me with him because I'm in love with Toto Wolf. If you haven't watched Drive to Survive on Netflix, you 100 million percent need to watch it. it tell me it's not the best show ever and then tell me you don't love total wolf as well so john is my kind of i i i've found out more about the intricate details in behind formula one and motor racing and just how much is involved in it the money the training of his of his his clients and his athletes neck training breeding training where he first came across it and how he uses it now and um we talked about business stuff and everything else really john is a legend we were we tried to record this this i opened the zoom to record this during the day and he was in a cafe or something like that and it was too noisy so i said look i'll talk to you later so he was sitting on the couch when his kids were gone to bed and it felt like kind of a chat over a couple of beers or a whiskey at night time so um go for a walk and just sit down and enjoy it i think you're really going to enjoy it and um please give it a share and a like and let me know i would have this conversation with john all day long regardless of the podcast so i'm not doing it for that but it does help me if you if you share it and comment or whatever and let me know what you thought of it because it helps me understand and i really i really appreciate that it's kind of those shares and comments and all that, those things are really the lifeblood of our business so they are important to me um other people say oh i don't care if someone shares it or not i do it's important to us so i appreciate it john is going to do a little bit of a, a short presentation for our members membership site dgr interactive just he's going to look at neck training and um for his athletes which is definitely good for any athletes that are involved in contacts any if you have athletes or train athletes or whatever involved in contact sport or motor racing or something like that so he'll do a nice presentation for us there and um apart from that i hope you enjoy the show and uh here is john noonan Hello, well good how are you i'm busy. good yeah busy yeah busy 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 trying to figure out how to be not as busy it's going okay okay just literally actually just looking at out of curiosity there um because we're going to apply for a mortgage soon i think so we're just kind of looking at finances and stuff like that recently and we're trying to figure out what 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 we can do but uh mm. we're, i was just looking at revenue this year versus last year and it's almost identical but i have worked probably i don't know somewhere between 50 and 70 percent like only 50 right. or 70 percent okay. of the time uh, as as last year so that's that's been, really good mate. That's it's really good, good that's good so if revenue can go up a little bit and, and time worked can go down like that's a big win i'd rather that than revenue doubling and my time that i was working dublin as well like. oh, mate i similarly like i've just um had a meeting with i've got a mentor business mentor that i've worked with for a few years now and we kind of put up and we saw the sort of trajectory of the last three years of it do this which was really nice and um it's like so what what problems have you got i was like well time <laughs> i haven't really got a lot of time anymore because in order to make that curve happen i think i've probably been a bit smarter and some nice opportunities have come along but I definitely applied more time and I'm, I'm pretty much looking at a couple of those income streams now and going, okay, how do I leverage time and value in those things to keep mm -hmm. the, the value of it coming in financially, but obviously mm -hmm. put a little bit less physical time mm -hmm. and energy into that, making that stream. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's the, it's the ever evolving challenge, isn't it? Of, of growing certain income streams and becoming a little bit more mm -hmm. wealthy, but not costly on time. Right. Yeah. It's tricky. It's just being clear about what you want. Hmm. I'm I'm way more clear now like that. I'm not willing to sacrifice everything like to make money. Good man. I never I never really was, but I'm more clear on that now. Like, yeah, you know. Yeah. But Has I do understand changed? That, what's changed. I don't know. Just just clarity, like mindset of of things, and maybe put just pushing pushing probably too far and realizing that how far too far is. Okay. And uh, I, I do understand like the the importance of working hard in bursts and, and stuff like that. And like 
there is times where you need to go hard so that hopefully you can like yield the benefits in the future so yeah that's true yeah so that's what hopefully our couple of years has been like that because like obviously we were just everyone thinks we have like passive income with our programs there's very little passive about it where it's you have to do instagram posts you have to do all this stuff every day and yeah i wake up the next morning and and we've made two or three or five sales of a program but like it, if i don't do my work the following day we're not going to sell them again so it's not I don't, I don't know is it does i don't i know very few people who are making passive income mm. i don't even know if that's a thing mate uh, i think this is it i i probably told myself i, I read uh that rich dad poor dad text i think i probably mm-hmm. mentioned it to you before and that really struck a chord with me and, and challenged like you talk there about mindset about how you earn money which was cool and he's got his quadrant of wealth right your employment consulting passive and investments and i was like okay so i started to tick the investment box and now i'm very much consulting with if you like the hints of thing could be employment but i'm doing nothing passive oh, i need more passive need more passive i need financial freedom that's what i need to be chipping away on and the more i looked into it i was like shit i've got to invest a lot of time to create something allegedly passive and like you say even then once it's built you look at the guys that have done you know I know you've had Kieran on recently and you're talking to him a lot about stuff and, and he's done his programs and they were a real success over the past decade. And, you know, I know loads of guys in my network that were tuning up that stuff, but you still have to do, as you say, the posting, spending money on the ads. There's nothing passive about it, is there? No. It's all a lie. <laughs> but the, 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 the attraction is still there, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's just leveraging. Like now my mindset has gone in. We might even leave it in some of this stuff. Um, because it might it might be good for the podcast. Um, nothing I, I'll give you I'll give you a final edit on it, don't worry. No, no, sound but, um, but um the my mindset has gone towards just leveraging like how how much can I lever or what what can I leverage? So like, yeah, I might put in the same work, but and Kier talks about this as well. It's like can if i do one hour i'm trading one hour for 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 that time now and and getting paid for one hour like or if i put in one hour can i be paid for 20 hours or 50 hours and that's where i'm that's where i'm trying to to leverage things Mm. as much as possible Mm. and i'm not there yet but that's where i'm trying to at least have my mind on that you know for sure and listen i'd i'd almost alongside that too one of the things i've been challenged on quite lately is right if you've got an income stream that isn't really really time intensive but you recognize that it's a value to the brand and to income streams or you know they're coming through this route and then you sell them all or you retain them into say a higher value product later Mm -hmm. how can you still retain the level of custom and the income that you get from that smaller but important income stream but take yourself away from it as you say the leverage can you subcontract can you bring in some value or you know like i guess that you've done with, with with your with your partner i'm trying to do the same but still not lose the value and or get down to the reasons of, well, why are people engaging in that? Well, it's because as you, it's your name on the front door. So if you pull yourself away from that income stream or product or service, mm-hmm. are you still going to have the same level of interest mm-hmm. and attraction? And that, that's something I'm really kicking around at the moment. Yeah. Because I, I don't know, like you could even broaden this into, is it right to put your name on the business? Like what leverage have you got longer term? Mm-hmm. But then, I was very attracted looking at, say, other, other guys out there. And they're huge names, and I'm not comparing myself, but the likes of an Eric Cressy yeah. or Mike, Mike Boyle. And I looked at them and thought, okay, well, there's clearly some legs in that. So what do you have to be to be a standout, you mm-hmm. know, distinguished figure in your field? You clearly have to be an expert. Mm-hmm. So how, you know, chase that path. But when you get to that point, you look at their success. Now they've got loads and loads and loads of people working for them. Yeah. And the brand's gone beyond who they are, right? Yeah, and yep. I'm sure when they age out or decide to step out of it from a physical operative, that it will still run in its in its in its fashion or its brand name. But... I think so. If I went to, if I was, if I had a problem, if I was a baseball player and I had a shoulder problem or an elbow problem, and I went to Eric Cressy and he said, "No, I'm not available," and he said, "Here's here's the guy you need to work with," I'd work with him. Mm. Because I trust that guy because Cressy said it more than I trust myself to find the next best person, you know. 100%. I mean, look at, um, we've obviously both been through Dave O'Sullivan's mm-hmm. work and in his philosophy. And when I joined, I joined a Super League club that he was working at and he called me up and he was like, listen, 
expect there's an opportunity here come because we'd worked previously together at uh, in Leeds in rugby union and I thought yeah wicked that's an easy win for me the, the opportunity was looking good and then Dave put the cherry on the top I thought yeah I want to work with someone like that again challenge me and challenge my practice because his philosophy is so strong and mm -hmm. the returns that he gets fantastic and you know it's like in many team sports you can go in and think I've really got a good a good base here and a really good toolbox and I really think I can get some great returns and get people on board and buy in but medically they're a sham or whatever and you, or you clash and Dave is not that, you know, he's a, he's an incredible guy to be working with. But when he stepped, literally I signed and he went, yeah, mate, I'm not going to stay. Oh, fuck. <laughs> he All right, Dave. The rug from Thanks, mate. <laughs> and he was like, but don't worry. Cause I've got my protégés that remained Ollie Waite and Ali McFarland and class, mm -hmm. class mate. And, and he, they just took his philosophy on and obviously made it their own as well and grew into that. But, outstanding clinicians and it just meant that Dave had done a really good job of disseminating yeah. that evidence down and really bedding it into practice that yeah. by and large the players sort of ran the script as well with that yeah. like they knew what the show was and it can be done it, it, it definitely can be done like we get people coming to us online Alice is there now we've 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 worked hard to get Alice in in the online space and people are doing sessions with her and they're getting brilliant mm -hmm. results and like I have no, I wouldn't put her there in the first place if I wasn't confident in her to do that, yeah. that job. And yeah, if given, and like, look, she knows this too. This is obvious. If given the choice, someone who comes in through David Gray Rehab Instagram is going to want to work with me, right? That's just the way it is at the moment, at least. But then the buyer there or the person, whoever it is, the client has to make a choice, right? Do I trust David's judgment to say this physio is good enough and she will give me the result versus here's my other options. Go into some hack down the street who doesn't have a clue what he's doing. And this is true from, from all over because mm. we have clients all over the world and that, that's the decision they're making. Mm. And once they, once they make that decision, once they do a session or two with Alice, they're, they're, they're delighted with that. They forget, they don't want to do a session with me anymore. So that's, that's cool. Like, but that initial, like, but I, to, to get that going, I had to close off my calendar. I said, I'm not taking any more clients. And we probably lost a lot of revenue and a lot of clients because 50% of the people probably said, okay, I'm not going to book in with Alice. I'm, and I'm not going to book in with David because I can't, but I had to make that choice. So it was just yeah. like, some people are going to have to jump, make, make the jump here and we'll build from there. And that's what we've done. And that's working so far. Love it. Love it. It's, uh, it, it, it's not an easy one to do, is it? When you are self-employed and you know, the book stops with you. And, and I've, I've had some of the challenges of late where I've decided this year is going to be the year that I, I do start to create some passive as whatever that is now, but, uh, and I did a bit, bit of a collab with, um, career blueprint. Josh Fletcher, really great guy, and he's but he's gone completely the way and gone heavy, heavy, heavy on the passive, mm -hmm. building products rather than chucking time into service, which is what I've done. Mm -hmm. And now I've kind of created this, like you, really, a demand of time uh, and a return for that time invested, and gone, yeah, but that money really helps us because of this, 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 and mm -hmm. I want to say no to that. But as you say, it's <laughs> you've got to make those decisions, right? If you want to build in areas where you're a little bit poorer, so. Mm -hmm. it's all strategy right how are you gonna what are you gonna do for passive without giving the game away There's yeah competition listening here now or you can give the game away it's better for my podcast but <laughs> <laughs> well if, if, if we're live and kicking um we're we are live we're live yeah, and kicking. all of that is going in unless <laughs> unless you want to click mm -hmm. so for me it will be trying to take something that's been incredibly personal and quite time intensive to keeping an aspect of that but then probably shaping it into a into a, a focus or a structure that's got a little bit more legs and a little bit more um, uh, of a market, a broader market appeal. So be that, you know, online courses or, or group cohorts, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think group is the way to go. I'd agree. We've spoken about this before. Yeah. I think group is the way to go. And I'm going to use Alice again as an example. So I've done a lot of calls over the last six, eight months with Alice one-to-one. -one. And like we discussed a client that she has had, and it's a discussion, like it's just, it's not me giving her the answer. I, I, I might not have the answer. She might have the answer, but it's just a discussion. Now, Alice is smart. She can ask very good questions. Sometimes I've done mentoring type of calls with other people, done one call, three calls, six calls, 12 calls, whatever. It doesn't matter. And 
the, the, the quality of my answer is really only, it depends on the quality of their question, right? Now, that obviously a mentor, you're supposed to reframe a question and stuff for them, but the quality of the question is so important that they are asking the right question in the first place. And what I've found is when you, even when you do like a presentation or there's a few people on a call, the person who maybe doesn't have the ability to ask a great question for whatever reason in the first place, but someone else on that call asks a great question and that person might have the ability to really take in that information and really like say, yeah, that really makes sense to me. And I have that problem as well, but they couldn't maybe voice that problem in the first place. And that's why I think the group now the size of the group is difficult mm. to figure out, but the group works really, really well. And I do think I would get better. I think say I had a group of 10 or a one-on-one -on -one call with someone, most people would choose the one-on-one -on -one call. I think the, if they all chose the group of 10, they all would get better results by being in that group and, and having a specific topic and then being able to branch off from there. Or, or I would say nine out of the 10 will get good results. Mm. The one who's like really detailed and really ha knows the exact things they want to ask, they will be better off one-on-one, -on -one. but there's not that many of them. Mm, mm, mm. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. And, you know, again, going back to the example of DOS, I, I, I don't know if you went through the online thing and, and I probably still get to complete the full online bit actually but i really enjoyed that and there was definitely an element of accountability that you know despite how ambitious i am it, it did tow you along with the journey and get things done at the time scale that's crucial for you know getting through it and the demonstrating the returns and pulling that into the community or mm -hmm. the facebook group i actually did a um when when the first lockdown hit march was it 2020 21. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yes, well, well, over 18 months, that was, so it must have been 2020. Um, and I, did, I, I felt a huge sense of, of accountability to thinking, well, okay, I, you know, I'm thinking, Jesus, what's going to happen now? How can I continue to uh, run a business that was very time intensive on, on services, no products at that point, but purely on services if I can't see people? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, it didn't quite be as dramatic as that because you could still do stuff and we could still travel and we could deliver our work but the mentorship for sure i mean that was already an online program but there's a lot of guys on the mentorship that were just pts mm -hmm. um or snc coaches that were in clubs or suddenly you know the rug was pulled underneath them i thought well how are we going to get people to a point where they feel they've got some safety they've got a group and they're at least going to hear how other people are tackling the same problems and, mm -hmm. and we i just put in extra calls every monday morning it was a bit of like a, a scene setter for the week let's attack this week here's what I'm doing, here's what you could be doing, and let's every week start to look at some different things. And then it kind of bled into different topics of, of practice and methods. But that was really good. And, and actually, there's a few at the end of that went, oh, can we keep doing that? And I think even a few kind of broke off and built some relationships. And, mm -hmm. and that that's invaluable, isn't it? You can't, I, mean, I, I wasn't certainly when I was marketing the one-to-one -one mentorship stuff. You don't market that stuff even if you think that yeah. what will the group get from this? Yeah, It was the unseen value that, yeah, that really I think pulled people. Yeah, but sure, I met you at Dave's at Dave's course. That's right. You yeah. know, I was only yeah. thinking about that earlier when I was thinking about. Yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, because I, you, I think you're very good at connecting with people. I, I, I struggle in in a, in a group. I'm. I think I'm okay. I'm, I think I'm not too bad when I actually get to know someone. But that initial getting to know someone, like I don't know, I'm a bit nervous. I don't know, a bit nervous. I'm, I'm just not great at that initial interaction. But no matter when, I, wherever I go to a workshop, if I'm sitting beside someone, there might be one person, and I always end up like in this like little bromance with one person or something. And that, that was you that time. And I think maybe it's because when I like first get to, I, I, you sit beside me or whatever, and we get chatting and then like throughout the whole weekend, I just don't really want to talk to anyone else. Cause then I have to get over that like initial encounter again. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. um, so yeah, no, that's I, where I I'd, first met you. I'd agree that, with that. Yeah. And that, um, that, the, that's where I didn't know anything about you and you didn't know anything about me yeah. and there was nothing to know about me, but I, um, I remember you, I, I think I answered a couple of questions or Dave asked a couple of questions at one stage and I just answered them early on or I, I gave my answer. And I think then you spent like the first half of the day of the first day, like peppering me with questions. And I was like giving you the little answer because you might have been a little bit behind on the content. And I was like, mm -hmm. delighted with myself answering this, answering that. And then later on or lunchtime, like someone was like, oh, that's, that's, that's John Noonan and like listed off your CV. 
And I was like, I just spent half the fucking day answering questions to this fella. And you let on, you never knew anything about anything. And I was like, that guy is, that's such a, <laughs> I just thought that was such a cool trait, like that you are so open to learning from some fella you just met, like we never, oh, mate, yeah, thanks. never did so, anything. Look, I, I, honestly, I felt as uncomfortable as you. And um, you know, what's, what's really interesting about strength and conditioning, especially working in team settings is that there's a, there is an assumption that you are a real huge extrovert, you know, banging your chest, running the atmosphere or huge ego that people just vibe off. And, and you can play the game and you can put on that mask and, I, and I've done that better in some instances, but naturally I'm someone that prefers to get into a bit of detail and have a really good one-on-one or, or chat with a few people. Mm-hmm. I don't need to be in huge crowds or I don't seek to do that on, on a, on a regular occasion. And in a setting like that, I felt, yeah, I was the only S&C in the room, I think. And that's not saying that I, th- I think I'm innovative, but I saw value in what Dave was doing and then I saw the pathway that he was on and I thought, well, hopefully I'll connect with some like-minded people. And all these, all these you know, people in the room like yourself were talking about, I work in private practice or I work a bit of sport or I've got these clients that are a bit tricky. And there was a relationship naturally with the practice between everybody there. And I felt, well, I'm going to try and sort of hang on someone's coattails here and you were that guy a little bit. And I think... I remember at the time, I thought you were, you were so, uh, along with the content, obviously, Doss, if you're listening, but you were really interested in the sales Doss of, I think, the box because <laughs> you were trying to get your gym kit out at the time and you were like, what are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm just try, trying to get my, my kit sorted out here and I'm getting some sales in. But it was, um, well, likewise, when Dave was introducing you, it was very clear straight away that he sort of, you know, called you up a little bit and went, oh, look at what, what Dave is doing here with, with the content since he came on mentorship and, I think you were leading an example of that, but, and obviously look at where you are now, mate. So, but no, it's um, trying to really dig into somebody and understand what makes them tick or an outstanding performer in their field. I'm I'm really into that. I'm constantly looking at who's exceptional in what space. What can I learn from that? And it's really it's, I, I've probably gone a lot more holistic in the certainly in the past decade of my career rather than just harder into sports science and S and C for sure. Yeah. That's where I. That's where I first heard your nickname. What's that? The glute. The glute. <laughs> <laughs> Mate. Because <laughs> you were doing an exercise or something. I know. I know. And I Dave know, was mate. walking past, and Dave goes, "The glute," like this, <laughs> and I just glanced, and I was like. God damn, <laughs> he is the glute, <laughs> mate. It's uh, oh, th- there's not even a really cool story behind it. I was working in um, in rugby union and I'd worked with a, a group of under 19 lads, and these lads were like part time students at the same time trying to be pro rugby. Great lads, and we went through from the 19s, and I got I got to first in role with them, and they came through, and it went on, and then kind of the first team started calling me the glute rather than Noonan or John or whatever, and. Even one of my best mates who was a coach at the time, he still calls me the glute. Or like on WhatsApp groups, it's like glute. It's not John or Noonan. And there's no, like, people go, if they're on like a mixed group, it's like, the glute, who's the glute? And it's like, oh, it's this guy. And, uh, but mate, like, you know, I guess the other association with that is that, and this is what was so cool about what Dave was doing and what you're now doing is that I was the guy back in 2010 2009 so I'd worked in football for a couple of years right and then went into rugby and I was the guy who was going right glutes are redundant they're on a holiday for everybody people have got freaking brilliant quads and calves let's get some glute mass because glutes are shit so I was putting mini bands on people right left and center you know I was trying to get to a fashion ribs down and get anterior core on but it was all about glute 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 soft tissue the glute then more glutes it was all day glute and hence it was the glute um and it, I was just I was mad on it mate huge on it and we got you got some some i think some good returns at the time but you did anyway stuck. yeah 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 it stuck mate <laughs> i've been called a lot worse i'll take the glute i'll take yeah, that the glute works yeah the glute. there's a lot of girls <laughs> on instagram that would take it <laughs> oh yeah i should put up a bit more should I? <laughs> um, <laughs> what um tell me about your motorsport stuff so far yeah, what's been going been- on your 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 guy just signed on to Formula Two today. Yeah, Formula Two, Frederick Vesti. Um, good guy, super super hard work. He looks good. He looks like a good guy. 
he is mate i watch his training obviously because i'm interested in in i know you're training him but like i watch him when he puts up his clips and then i watch max verstappen putting up a clip i'm like (laughs) (laughs) you know it's funny it's it's um look i I guess the parallels that you draw between those who are already well established in a say a first team in football to an academy you know ambitious young gun there's some similar paradoxes there right the first team guy or the well-established guy isn't always doing the high end, high performing stuff, mm-hmm. despite their, their status, their skill set. You know, they're just anomalies sometimes, right? In how, how they do what they do. And Max is definitely one of those. Lewis is another. Mm-hmm. There's probably another couple of other standout candidates in that space who aren't, if you like, doing some, you know, quality high end stuff. And that's not, that's not, I'm, I'm not certainly just because I've mentioned those guys because I know. I've got a couple of nice colleagues there. I don't want to call them out. That's not fair either. But there's definitely there's definitely drivers in that space that have got there because of talent and and, and other reasons. But they've got to be you know, still good enough in the physical department. They're just not. Maybe that's not seen as one of their X factors. Mm-hmm. Or, or what are their interests? I mean, but you look at Fredo. You just mentioned, and he definitely is. You know, he loves it. Loves it, mate. Um, and he's um, a little bit different. I mean, most. Most guys coming in that space have come from affluence. You've got to be wealthy to get in that sport. I mean, if you're going to drive in Formula Two, you, you you're at least paying into a seat of two million on average. You like you give that money. You're not getting paid to to drive in that oh, seat. It's not like Jesus. even an academy, you know, rugby or football. You're getting paid a salary. You pay an amount of money to drive in that team. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you've got a team, I need to pay to be, be on your team and come and drive mm-hmm. for you for a season. And on top of that, if, if I crash the car, then I'm picking up that. You're not picking up the damage for that either. So, Oh, really? So huge... it's either coming from your dad or like big sponsors? Sponsors, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, Fred, Fred and the team around Fred have done incredibly well to to put themselves in a position um, where he's got an opportunity and uh, huge respect for, for what they've done and, and yeah. how hard they work. And um, But yeah, mate, like these are some of the best, the best in the world at what they do. Um, And they're on a pathway like, you know, like most, I keep referring to football, but I guess it's maybe what a lot of people could relate to. But often you're an associate with an academy as well. So Fred's on the Mercedes Academy, the Young Drivers Programme there, and you'll get other drivers that are associated with Red Bull or Williams or Alpine or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And that helps for a number of reasons, right? Branding for one, sponsorship opportunities too. Um, And then some other, it can change between teams of what, what benefits a driver might yield, but... Yeah, man, they're um, they're pretty good. And I I started working in this space 2019, originally with a French guy called Giuliano Alessi, again, another top kid. Um, and right now he's actually in Super Formula in Japan. But they're, um, it, it's a really interesting sport because a lot of the heavy lifting isn't really done on track. Like someone would say, well, what do you want an S&C for? And I think when I met, going back when I did my UKCA, I started doing the... Um, the workshops and there was a guy on the workshop at the time i didn't catch his name and i said oh what, what, what sport do you work in he was like oh f1 and i was like i was waiting football at the time my first other job and i sort of laughed and i didn't mean to i was like oh what do you work in that sport for surely you're not doing much and he was i think looked at me like like he should like an idiot mm-hmm. and uh and and now i think i appreciate a lot more and i'm less less ignorant to that but there's a lot of demands that they have to get through mm-hmm. um I think my boss has described it once as driving that car is like running a marathon whilst playing chess, whilst being hit in the head repeatedly because because the, the demands are, yeah. are huge, yeah. massive. I only um, I, I didn't re- I didn't appreciate. It. I watched Drive to Survive, right. and then I was completely hooked. Yeah, I was the 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 last race with Max versus Lewis. I I I think I think. I've kind of fell out and out of love with sport over the last few years a little bit. I don't know why, just maybe some of my own injuries that happened in sport and stuff like that, maybe just left a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Now, sport is like still a massive part of my life. It was all of my life at one point. So I'm still obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with sport. But that race, I actually almost the entire season i just spent off my couch screaming at the television that raised me and Kira were (laughs) absolutely jumping around the kitchen and like if you told me two years ago you'd be doing that watching a formula one race i would have laughed in your face yeah 
yeah it's, but obviously yeah. like the, the drive to survive if anyone hasn't watched it like you have the it's done a lot for the sport yeah. oh my god the understanding of the the personality behind the person like the team dynamic the understanding what's going on in the pit like all these and i'm not not an expert by any means but like I, I could watch the, the race going on between the lads in the midfield now and you know, understand this little dynamic. It's That's unbelievable. It. So I can That's only imagine it. what it must be like for you to have someone, obviously it wasn't Formula One, but have yeah, someone yeah. in the car yeah. and you're standing there watching, like, biting your nails at every corner, I presume. Mate, it, 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 it's hard not to. It really is. And, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's only... So in F1, there's at least 23 races plus the tests. At least there will be this year. Uh, for us in Formula 2 coming this year, there's 14 races, which is the most there's been actually since, well, I was involved in, in 19, but 12 races and two, sorry, 14 races and two tests. So you do all the European events, you're not doing the flyaway events to, you know, the internationals like Brazil or something. And of course, you accrue points like in any competition, right? And by the end mm-hmm. of it, you're in, you're in the shop window. Um, and and, it, and it, it's everything to these guys, especially the top 10, the top 10 who, who, probably with legitimacy or in a, in a fair crack of if you're in an F2, you're trying to get an F1 seat or at least become a reserve driver to maybe piggyback into a spare seat if possible. Cause that's mm-hmm. not always the, the chosen way in, but it, it, it's such a bottleneck tight level at the top that you've got to have the skill set. You've got to perform well in the competition. You need to have enough backing behind you as a package financially to be able to pay into a seat at the same time um, and be seen as someone that, a team would feel they want to work with or is right for them in their environment, their culture. And it's, um, it's a challenge, but I, I'm really relishing it because, you know, quite often the teams that you work with, their skill set is either they're a mechanic, they're an engineer, or they're a principal and they're looking at the function of, of how the group are working together. They're rarely looking at the driver and their performance. And that's where someone like me is, I guess, a coined perform- performance coach as the group I work with callers. And you, I was a little bit uncomfortable with the title at first because strength and conditioning coach. You know, I don't, I, I don't believe in kind of you know giving yourself titles. I think you are what you are, and, and you deliver to that. Maybe you expand, and but certainly within this world, you have to expand because if you don't, you're you're going to get redundant pretty pretty quick pretty quickly. Because as you pointed out already, you've got the demands of helping them perform in the car. You've got the recovery between. You've got you've got to help them travel. Sorry, cope with a travel schedule. Um, almost help them as well organize their life a little bit away from the track because of they're a one-man band trying to look after all these little spinning pieces um and then of course the intensity of of the race day itself and being in the right place at the right time and even coping with some sort of the psychological setbacks and Mm -hmm. working within the group that i work with now i went in thinking well i could apply some common sense from a psychology point of view but would never profess to even touch on that space or have a conversation that may be leading into a space that I can't, I can't go, but inevitably, because you are probably one of, you know, the, uh, the most ideal people in that setting to have a conversation about handling pressure or overcoming adversity and risk, or as a, as a underperformance or mm-hmm. a crash or something and pulling them back around because they've got a rest the next day on the same day. You, you've got to be that person. So you, you learn pretty quickly. And it's, you um, have to be that person. Good. I, I think that's the same yeah. I understand like it's the same like you have to be careful with the psychology stuff but mm. this person or these players or whoever you work with really it's it's more so in that sport I definitely I think but like they trust you and they're getting unsolicited advice from everyone else oh, anyway yeah. about pressure and oh put that into like here's what you should be thinking about here's what you should be thinking about so like if they're coming to you for advice are not even but but you just know them really well like what are you supposed to do not bring it up or 100%. not talk to them that's that's 100%. that frustrates me like i know there's a fine line but that does frustrate me that some people say stay in your box it's like hang on what is my box here that i shouldn't be communicating mm-hmm. with the person and mm-hmm. speaking to them about what they're feeling like mm-hmm. you know it's definitely i mean coming back to football i've, I've had some challenges in that space and and i think that you know for sure the more experience that you gather, the more roles that you've been in, you know, I'm, I'm, what am I now? 14, 15 years in the industry full time. And, and you, you can't help but unsee or you can't not unsee good practice, right? So if I'm going <laughs> to name drop him again, he's going to love this, but DOS mm-hmm. and others. And you go, right, I know what Pinnacle is because I've seen the returns and I've seen 
the re-injury rates or, or the injury rates that start in place along with a good physical program. And you know what world leading practice is. So when you go somewhere that isn't and you try and tentatively ask some, some questions and, and maybe lead them down a path to open a conversation about maybe we could do this differently. And if folks kind of give it their stay in your lane response, that's really frustrating to hear because mm -hmm. there isn't an appreciation for, do you know what? We don't know all and we could be listening to some, maybe someone else or at least integrating practice with someone that comes from, you know, a decent background and has seen a good, a good few things. And, and that in certain settings is certainly rife. Um, and I haven't always handled it ideally, but it, it is an issue that, you know, we always talk about multidisciplinary practice and especially we're often at loggerheads between S and C's and medical and, and I think that I'd like to think that it is improving actually in the past decade. I think it is. I think that practice has really accelerated forwards, but for sure the best clinicians or practitioners are the ones like you who have got, you know, a standout handle on their space already, their discipline, whether it be S and C or sports science or trend conditioning or nutrition. And then they hybrid that with another, another associating contributing factor of another discipline like i then went into right i'll go and look at dos and others and you and right how can i get physical therapy under my boat so when i'm on the track or i'm seeing my goal for or whoever i can put hands on people if necessary and go i'm seeing a red flag now and i'm going to be proactive in managing that and getting them away from whatever contraindication that might be to mm -hmm. i'm just looking at an injury in the face here i think i can intervene now and pull it around and keep you healthy because we're all in it for the same reasons um, and I think if you can look back the hard lines of, oh, but litigation this, and you know, it's not your place to do that, and just open the space to shared practice and invite people to share their ideas and, and figure out where it fits within your philosophy or your group, I think you can go far. Mm -hmm. um, and not enough teams are prepared to do that, straight mm -hmm. up at least. Mm -hmm. But if that, you know, leadership isn't coming from top down. So mm -hmm. that's, that's been a gripe of mine for sure. But in, in this setting, for the one-to-one -one, you you have to be able to do that and the, and the best coaches that in the peer group that we have are the ones who at least have a couple of strong factors behind them you yeah know, sport science or nutrition or something or yeah and then if, if we don't know something we'll put our hand up and go right actually there's there's quite a unique case there or a candidate who needs to go and speak to a medical expert for that or a sleep expert for this or psychologist for that and we'll pull those specialists in which is good and then we, we the way that we usually learn is that actually a lot of that support might get delivered through us if it's appropriate or we'll mm -hmm. step out and we'll plug that person in. So it still is a multi multidisciplinary practice, yeah. but you're almost there. You are, you, you're the performance lead for that individual looking at what they yeah. need and you're pulling people in and out or manipulating that situation to fit and optimize what you want. What does, what does the lead up to Give me an idea of the lead up to so we for so the in Formula One the drivers are getting there on a Thursday are they to the track usually yeah usually usually are they staying well depending on where they are they might be flying there then the Wednesday and staying there the Wednesday night and then getting to the track on Thursday yeah for the for the for the flyaway events when there's there's a big difference in in time zones and they want to climatize they they will do a shift obviously pre and during flight but they may go. A couple of days earlier or even you know a number of days earlier in order to get on site mm -hmm. get their time zone acclimatized get used to the food the time is everything else mm -hmm. and then and they'll make their shift when, are you, on the, when are you getting there sorry when so when are you getting there what what day is for your the, race for the european ones so we'll race this year we're going to race still it has been every year but last year was three races every weekend which was heavy this year there's two races every weekend which is kind of back to the usual format so There'll be a, a race on a Sunday and a Saturday. Previously, it's been, I don't know why, but a feature race like the big race on a Saturday mm -hmm. and then a sprint race, a shorter race on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think it might get flipped this year, but working back for us, you've got a race Sunday, a race Saturday, and then on a Friday, you've got a, quite a busy one. So you'll do free practice in the morning, which is 45 minutes. And then the afternoon, they'll qualify the same day, sometimes three hours later or maybe longer, depending on. So Bahrain, for instance, will do, uh, quite a late one so it might be say five or six hours between that free practice and uh, qualifying or otherwise if it's somewhere like um, I don't know Holland or something it'd be like three hours difference minimum really quick turnaround so they'll um, you know that 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 free practice in the morning isn't too exhausting but it's challenging enough and especially for the teams who've got to turn the car around if there's been an issue or a shunt mm -hmm. or something 
to get everything sorted out. But they're trying to do as much learning as possible about the car, the tyres, the temperatures, how all that is associating with each other to figure out, right, we think we're going to be in the window for this and we're going to run this strategy. Uh, you figured out, driver, that these are your sectors to work on here. These are your touch points that are going to be important for you. And they're, they're constantly trying to refine that process all year. Um, the day before that is is the Thursday. That's a setup day. It's a meetings day. The engineers, mechanics are still doing bits and bobs to the car, getting it where they want to be. Um, and then before that, any other prep that we're doing is, is simulator based. So maybe they'll go to the simulator. So uh, Fred, for instance, he'll go to France in Paris and they'll get on a the sim. They'll do a day and they'll run simulations of what they think is going to happen. And again, trying to recreate the conditions as best you can. And they'll, 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 they'll figure out some strategies there and they'll try and Class. execute those Class. on a weekend. Have, so, have you ever gotten in the sim? No. <laughs> well, I've got, I've gotten in, I've gotten in a, a driver's sim at home and uh, I've just trashed on every corner, mate. And it's what, <laughs> what, what they do it's um you think it's you think it's so easy like no i don't I don't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's just me the idiot then but you're naive enough like you, know, you go bowling with your mates right and you see someone who's pretty good and mm -hmm. what they're doing you think yeah i can do that and you start flooring it and you realize that actually there's a huge amount of skill and tact to this i mean yeah. to maneuver a car at 300 plus if you're f1 at least 300 kilometers an hour um at high speed with at least 19 other cars competing for the same racing line that you won uh, and you're making knife edge uh, split decisions on a knife edge that a uh, whisper of touching someone else mm -hmm. or spinning yourself and losing your line and losing tenths of a second which of course mean a podium or not like it's 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 huge mate yeah. um, when i like when i'm watching that and they're wheel to wheel I'm like, ah, look, I, I can't hold it in. <laughs> and then I'm like, there's they're just not even the entertainment, but the appreciation of how did they not crash there? Yeah. How did they, like, there's a millimeter between their tires and, yeah. they, and they navigated it. Yeah. Like, it just, it's bananas to me. It's because I, I, when I'm watching, I have a problem now when I'm watching sports. It's almost like I'm looking at the matrix. I'm like seeing this computer in, Lionel Messi's head like the way he makes decisions I'm like looking at him making decisions I'm like he just analyzed 16,000 options in this split second and chose the right one and then executed on it and then 100%. the, the yeah. Formula 1 is like multiplied that by a million like you know it, it, it's amazing because how like you try and appreciate their like you're talking there about reference right it's a perception of what they see and the information that they're taking in and you're trying to constantly evolve and, and refine that process. And, you know, the likes of Lewis and Max and the way that they do that is, and, and to do it with such consistency as well, like be as prolifically successful. And okay, they're in some great equipment and there's an argument for, well, you're going to be in the best teams. Of course, you've got the quickest car, but they still have to deliver in that vehicle every single week. So you can't just, you can't turn up for a race and then, and then kill everyone else and then go, oh, I'm going to go on holiday all week because you've got the championship to win. Yeah. So they're phenomenal, mate. Um, you know, an, an area that's certainly less discussed and a little bit less unknown. And I think you see it in a couple of other, other sports that probably don't talk about either, but it is how you're training the visual system. Um, and that whole neurocognitive space of retaining information, making split decisions. And that undoubtedly is the space that, you know, once you get these guys fit enough, within reason, they're on a very similar playing field. It's pointless me, I said to my all the time, we're not going to try and make you 10% fit or 10% stronger. You're fit enough. Of course, we can keep pushing those margins because we recognize the fit you're going to be, the better you can recover, the better you'll handle your travel, the quicker you're going to recover between each one of those events as well. That's great. And we're going to keep pushing those margins. They're important to us. But we're not going to spend an extra hour a week on that if we think the return is minimum, if nothing else. What about if we push this space how can we be more innovative there and go to the specialists who've got some of that information mm -hmm. like you were referring to before that that's the margins that's where you're going to make the differences in performance mm -hmm. because for someone like in that situation you give out there that wheel to wheel there's so much feel to it as well that you yeah. just don't appreciate and they're like i was talking to my guy the other day and he's like he's in the sim and he was talking about having a feeling and, and some guys are really, really instinctive with that. And they just drive purely on feel and other guys are very much through the data. 
seemingly through my reference, the best seem to have a really good handle on both. They can look at data and go, ah, that's the line, is it? Or that's why I need to do my throttle here. I'll, I'll try and bring this into what I'm doing there. And they'll, they'll, they'll match it with feel. But others, but you get these you know, enigmas like, you know, everyone talks about Lewis when he was coming up and his engineers now are still around and they're talking to other drivers and they go, this guy was teaching me mm. data. Like he would go, nah, the car needs to go in this direction. Yeah. And then they would they'd fashion a strategy off of that. So they're incredible. Like, you know, the messes and what have you, they're still around. But um, it, it, it's trying to get... It, <laughs> It's recognizing the limitations of an individual performer and, see, and thinking, right, where's the most cost effective or where's our best return of investment and trying to push push their week in that direction or push their time that way. Mm-hmm. It's nuts. Your job for this year is to get me in that sim. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever you need to Mate, do. If you've got some cash, if you've got some cash, we can make it happen. Sponsor. <laughs> <clears throat> if you've got some cash, I'm sure somebody will listen. Um, if there's ever a problem you can't solve with his body, hook, just <laughs> fly me in. <laughs> Mate, for sure. For sure, for sure, yeah. Mate, it's, um, yeah, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's, What's uh, um, special. <clears throat> with that with that structure of the the few days coming up to a race or whatever mm. what's your job with his training how much time are you getting with him and what are you doing in that time um <clears throat> excuse me so the i guess in the race week you it's it's kind of damage limitation really so if you if you're trying to maintain or tickle certain physical qualities you, you're doing it in the minimalist minimalist amount so, you know, microdosing obviously comes to the fore there and you're thinking about, right, what type of strength or what type of loading do we want to do that's going to help you get in the car and still feel like you, were, you know, it's, it's like if you, if, you, if, you go, if you go with the idea of somebody who plays five-a-side football every week and suddenly doesn't play it for a few weeks and you go back and play five-a-side football, which most people can relate to, you feel it because there's a range of demands there that you just haven't ticked a few boxes with. And if you can try and at least stave off any any acute changes in, say, fatigue or loss of stiffness, say, around ankle and feet, for instance, if you can sustain some of that stuff through doing either plyometrics or some high-load isometrics where you're trying to minimize tissue damage but getting after some mechanical damage mm-hmm. um, or tensile damage, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm after there. And then probably doing some cardiac output stuff as well. So these guys have to do for the duration of the race, at least 75 to 80% of their, of their max heart rate and sustain it. So we'll do a lot of threshold work where we're trying not to creep them into higher anaerobic anaerobic levels, but we want to, we want to basically keep on stretching their tolerance for work and working on aerobic recovery. So their ability in race is good enough to handle some of those fatiguing elements. Um, so it's, it's very minimum. And if we can, like in Formula 2, for instance, or Formula 3, the category we did last year, you've got at least, in most instances, two weeks to three weeks turnaround, unlike the F1 who you know regularly go back to back to back to back, which is where the preseason, like now, is all the more important and they're trying to raise up any physical levels so that mm-hmm. knowing that they may fall off in season a little bit, they can still mm-hmm. sustain some of those. Um, but yeah, he'll go in the gym maybe do a, uh, so we say so if you're going to travel on a Wednesday which he usually does the Tuesday would probably be some sort of cardiac output stuff which is a low end zone to work um, maybe a little bit of token strength but we're talking two to three exercises maybe two sets total all up the Monday might be a little bit more and certainly we'll get some lower limb stuff in there um, lots of lots of trunk lots of bracing and of course neck because mm-hmm. for these guys mainly in season they get a huge amount of neck stimulus anyway from driving. Like they're handling two to six Gs in a corner. It's certainly at high speed. And it's, you know, it's not uncommon to see, and you'll see their images. If you look at them from say race one on podiums to last race, their, their neck's like a third of the size. <laughs> it's just hypertrophied so much because of the sheer loading that they're getting through and the volume of practice. Yeah. So we see that as well in our guys. So you're trying to get them almost like to peak levels, but knowing that, just the rate of loading, the velocity on that neck. Yeah. You just can't replicate that enemy stuff that we're doing in the gym. Like we've got, there's a, you'll see a lot of guys on Instagram using a range of harnesses mm-hmm. um, and, and guys like me trying to tug at various speeds on the, on their necks, but you're just not, 
you're just not replicating a lot of that loading, especially the velocity yeah. aspect. So you're just yeah. trying to work on maximum strength as best you can and some fatigue. It does seem there. regardless of how good or bad their SSC stuff is, you know, and that's subjective, it does seem that the, they all do neck work. <laughs> yeah. No Very matter what. So. Because they probably just have to. If you had like, if you could only do one thing, it'd probably be neck, would it? Yeah, mate. Which I don't think I've ever said about anyone else. (laughs) You know, it's funny because Dan John. What does Dan John say? If you could only do train for fifteen minutes, what would you do? Yeah, I didn't think the answer would ever be neck. (laughs) And it's um, no, obviously there's a lot of these guys. They they're young, you know, they're young teenagers. A lot of them, especially in Formula Two, so they're after you know mirror muscles and the rest of it, but. It's funny because you see these 60 kilo guys walking around with a huge neck. It just doesn't fit. Like I saw an image of another guy, this F1 guy today, and his neck looks like this, the size of a guy who's six and a half and over hundred kilos. Like it just doesn't fit. It's, it's quite, it's quite funny, but you know, there's a weight restriction in this category as well. And, and Formula One, they're a bit more con- concerned with it because literally every, every gram is a contribution to, mm-hmm. you know, drag force or um, everything else. So, it, we're trying to be mindful of that area. Um, you know, we are pushing the boundaries of body composition a lot as well. We're trying to get great fitness to weight ratio, power to weight ratios, and and everything else. But it's um, you get you get a good block in preseason, and then in season, undoubtedly, you're just trying to maintain certain qualities. We get we get a bit more luxury to do, if you will, smaller camps or smaller periods of good dense work in season. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly as they're moving up the categories, their time just becomes a little bit yeah. more difficult to come by with all the sponsored meetings that they're doing, meetings with managers and traveling around to do all the practice, all the same stuff. And a lot of guys do karting as well. Like they'll use that as a training stimulus too in season mm-hmm. for their neck or just for their driving skills. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's are a real doing, mixed bag. Are you doing much to, um, to relax the neck, like to get it to chill? It must so, be smoked after a race. Like it is. It yeah. Is. Yeah. So, <laughs> you'll see you'll see a lot of guys like me in, in the garages afterwards and it, it differs depending on the driver but a lot of them become I think a little bit over reliant on a lot of the soft tissue stuff they love a hands-on stuff mm-hmm. and you know you'll, you'll get a lot of guys like me who haven't come from a training background who have got medical background physio background and, they'll, and that is their go-to like they'll, that's their core that's their core tool and they'll lead with that pre and post like a warm-up will be hands-on and mm-hmm. post will be hands-on as well and Mm-hmm. I try and I'm not not because I'm trying to be lazy. I try not to be too onerous with the hands-on stuff unless he goes, do you know what? I'm really struggling with this hit yeah. today or whatever, and we'll get yeah. it unstuck. But um, we'll do predominantly a lot of the the breathing stuff. Yeah. Um, and I picked that. Well, I mean, you've you've really made it your own now, which is wicked. But I picked a lot of that stuff from from DOS initially in. Um, 2012 2013 i saw him doing a lot of that stuff with Leeds rhinos at the time in, in rugby league mm-hmm. similar we, to the neck stuff there right right and, and yeah he was doing a lot of the, he called it a control pause test where you would you take the mouth at the time and I, a lot of people you know if, if anyone outside of that outside of that gym or that Leeds rugby franchise would come in and go what what's going on here that looks mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. too out there for me and you know we have a lot of coaches come in and they're really intrigued with what we were doing in that space and that's what I love about Dave is yeah. if he thinks something is going to work or works or yes. he just has a like a theory on something, he'll try it and yeah. he doesn't give a shit what people think. Yeah. Maybe yeah. he does, but he does it anyway. And equally, yeah. if he thinks it's not working anymore or whatever, he'll throw it out. I love the lack of emotion emotion towards clinical reasoning and like... I love that. I know he got criticized maybe last year, was it on Twitter for something he said about a balloon or whatever. And yeah. um, I, d- I think maybe he learned a bit from that the way, he, the way he was communicating things. But like, also, I don't think he gives a fuck because just like, if it works, I don't care. That's it. That's it. And I think we're all, we're all very quick when a few eggs get thrown to go, oh yeah, but the research, the research. And sometimes when the research hasn't quite caught up with, level of practice or if you want evidence-based practice for whatever you know subjective opinions you've got that lead you down that path if you're getting returns and you can take some confidence if consistently that you're getting great returns and it was clear that people were feeling better after doing it people were moving better we were seeing less soft tissue injuries um and it was almost like 
it, you know, people talk about be careful, there's no silver bullets and you shouldn't hang practice on one thing. But for someone who, like, <laughs> another reason I was called the glute was because I was mad not just about <laughs> getting glutes on and glute mass. I wasn't touching people, by the way. You, but as much as trying to get that on, I also understood that glutes were, were, were terrible or not working well or single leg stability or hip extension was poor if they didn't have good hip mobility, i.e. they couldn't abduct, abduct and hit key positions when they sprint. Mm -hmm. And what's really helped me is kind of looking at, if we look at the functional anatomy in motion, in performance and go, what's missing? And then what's the answer to get the return? Not just put, say, a strength band on a hip and do like an IIS for like 15 minutes and then sit on a ball for 20 minutes or whatever else, but really look at what's driving that response what's the stressor and hit that stressor. And every time, you know, DOS would always go, well, yeah, but I might have to do some soft tissue, but before I do, let's go and do this low load isometric or let's chill them out completely and just get their rib cage to move on, their pelvis to shift. I'll maybe do this with their foot whilst doing some breath work. And then magic would happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw guys, I saw guys coming into a treatment room with real acute, say, uh, adductor tendinopathy and literally walking out within half an hour and going, I feel great. Yep. And I was like, I'm not sure about that. And the more I started to dig into it and look at it, the more I was really intrigued. Yep. And he did a few things on me because as SNCs do, you're always bashing yourself up with, you know, stupid Olympic lifts or whatever else. And, you know, long behold, you started to feel great. And as we're physical guys, right? We want to try stuff out. And if we see and feel the return, we're bought. I, I certainly am. I'm bought in instantly. I don't, necessarily need to see some really well-established peer-reviewed literature mm -hmm. providing that i can get the return i can deliver it to someone else and get a same return yeah. long story short mate I, I went into the postural restoration stuff when they came over to the uk the year i was at giants i think martin higgins another clinician was working with dos and they brought him over um and i really liked it and i did the postural respiration stuff and it was all about appreciating the role that the diaphragm's got to play the understanding of how your diaphragm and your breathing system, your respiration system um, speaks to and communicates with your nervous system. And that if we've got issues with our breathing that drives, say, rib issues or pelvic issues or movement issues, then we've probably got a, a nervous system problem as well. So what if, we, what, what if we get unstuck there? And then I think, again, DOS being quite innovative, it, the, 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 the value started to really hit home, the richness of it when he was like, listen, I've been doing it. And by the way, HRV says this as well. And every time you were applying it, HRV was coming right back. It was bouncing right back up where you want to see it. So people were getting out of fight or flight freeze. They were moving better. And, you know, we were doing, um, uh, it's pretty common, right, to do, say, a self-assessment movement screen on a morning. Lads would come in um, and you do, you know, in pre-season, you capture it, you get your baselines. And then in season, usually after, say, a heavy pre-season block or really, sort of aggressive competition they'd come in monday morning they'd be trash and, and by a given you know they'd, they'd be down a little bit but you take them through a process of right get the nervous system to settle down restore loss of position and then put them through some sort of usual like a, a complex of, of movement and it could be a series of i don't know crawling or lunging patterns yeah or even under load and you guys came right back and they felt great and it just meant that you could get more aggressive earlier in the week rather than waiting for people to to yeah. come around and recover and for sure we saw less soft tissue injuries i mean yeah i'd never seen you know a lot of people go away well, injuries are injuries they're always going to happen and, and sure to some extent we accept that that's that that is the case but after that experience and then seeing it through practice in the past decade i refuse to believe that that we should be accepting of soft tissue injuries that we're missing a trick especially re-injuries Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be seeing those if we're getting things right and we're really able to assess and look at a system with good detail. And, mm -hmm. you know, one, one thing you said there was like, the, you're able to, you're able to get a bit more aggressive earlier in the week. I think that's the thing that people don't understand about the breathing stuff. It's that this, this stuff, if you do it well, and there's a lot of people not doing it well, by the way, like there is, there is mm. a very important, like the cues you use, the positions you put people in, the based on their bodies, all these different factors, there is different ways to coach the breathing and things like that. There's, there's a lot of different tools you have than just like 
breathing. There's so many different ways to attack it and ways to get expansion and compression in different parts of the body. What people, I think some people who are critical don't understand. And mm. it's, I think sometimes they, they see some of the work I do in the programs and they're like, oh, it's just softly, softly and stuff like that. It, one, it is because the programs are like generic and they're literally called basics programs, not advanced programs. But also if I was doing, if you saw me doing that with my own clients, you would see me get way more aggressive than other, a lot of other rehab professionals are, are training earlier than, mm. than, than a lot of them. And the reason I'm getting more aggressive earlier is because we've cleaned up stuff quicker because we've done that work. Mm. Whereas other people are like slowly building up and like, oh, we're we're trying to load you in positions that you can't really access. So we can only go for 50% load, 60% load. And you, you saw the same thing like 10 years ago or whatever it was. Clean stuff up use this yeah. stuff clean it up and then attack the things you need to attack stop spending so much time <clears throat> reading stuff is saving people time not the other way around 100 percent. and um you know i think there's a lot of so there's some, there's some really good practice now being delivered by you know say the likes of jonas tawia dodu this you know sprint coach and uh, I've, I've yet to see uh, him in person but I know JB Marin and those guys, you know, are really into speed. They're starting to talk more about not just the mechanics of what's good sprinting, but how do you recover or get people into a more ideal mechanics to hit better speeds more often? And undoubtedly, if you're getting people out of extension, because, you know, again, another reason I love, love the glutes was that as S&Cs, we would hammer extension. We would squat them heavy. We'd clean them heavy. We'd sprint them. We'd jump them. We'd load them into extension as much as possible with the theory that if we can extend harder and put more force into the ground, we'll, we'll jump higher, sprint faster, cut, cut, cut better. Mm-hmm. Great. And that was all the, you know, the raw power, the horsepower stuff. But for me, if you, if you just put a little bit more emphasis on the mechanical quality of that work and how it's delivered and how it's trained, you tended to get a more efficient athlete. I felt and someone that was less, just looking for extension in every situation and had more movement options and a variability about how they would execute the same problem. Um, And those guys are always more robust. They were better skilled movers and they got hurt less often. And, you know, I mentioned before about, I think clinicians having probably quite a broad scope of interest and practice, they wouldn't just rest on the laurels of, yeah, but this guy needs a bit of time. He just needs a bit of rest. And if we just do, like you say, this really careful incremental loading approach. He'd come back around in a few weeks. You know, someone would say, oh, that's a hammy. That's going to take eight weeks. And on the nose, eight weeks, there you go. Now he's back to you or he's back on the paddock, which is BS because, you know, I think world leading practice says, why can't we do that in six weeks? If, you know, safe and efficacy is met and everything else, and we, we tick all the right boxes and do all the right things. But if we put our heads together and go, right, what are the reasons this person is in this situation in the first place. What have we missed? How do we need to factor that history, that information into what we need to do next rather than just treat a scan or think, do you know what? We have to live by these timescales. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I hate, I hate that level of practice on that. I think it's lazy, mate. I think it's lazy. And I think, I think lazy clinicians and practitioners do that and, and they go, oh, it's time and we have to respect the time. Yeah, of course we do because tissue healing is tissue healing rates. But if you can look outside the box and look at things, I think more globally, it asks some questions of it. I think you get better returns. Yeah. Like that, on, the pel- on, the, on the, what you're saying about the sprint coaches like JB Marine, Jonas, yeah. people like this. I've never not heard a, a, a world-class sprint coach talk, not talk about sprint posture and mechanics and things like this. And the, the importance of the pelvis and all this stuff. Every ex- exclusively every single one of them appreciates that right number one but yet when people get injured and they go they go to a rehab professional the 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 thought process now is it's everything is load they were just there was just too much load and mechanics do not matter just make Mm. the tissue stronger Mm. so that doesn't marry with uh and and don't get me wrong that's really important but that doesn't marry with the world class and and spring coaches i think world-class spring coaches are the best coaches in the world i think because they are taking someone on on a four-year cycle to compete in the 100 meter sprint which is going to last nine and a half seconds so I'm training you for four years to run nine and a half, nine point six, nine point whatever. Like 
the level of detail there to, to get someone to peak at that, at that stage and to get, and, and also sprinting is the most participated sport in the world, probably mm. after maybe football. I don't know. Mm. I don't know the numbers. So these guys are unbelievable in my, in my opinion, if you want to learn about mechanics, go to a sprint coach, a good sprint coach, they'll teach you. Mm. So they all appreciate the importance of the pelvis. And, and the movement of the hips and all this stuff and posture and things. And, and I'm not talking about, for people listening, posture with regards to pain. I'm not talking about that in po- posture with regards to what they speak about and, and post- sprinting posture. So pelvis is important. We've established that. I can draw one simple line or one simple arrow and show you that the rib cage has a direct influence on what's happening at the pelvis. Very simply. It doesn't take me long lift your sit down lift your ribs up in the sky feel your pelvis go forward into an anterior Mm. tilt Mm. flex your ribs down feel your pelvis go into a posterior tilt we don't when we're sprinting we don't want either of those things we'd like a more neutral pelvis Mm. so with with two or three words i can show you how the rib cage affects the pelvis and then with another two or three words i can explain to you how breathing affects the rib cage which affects the pelvis and now the research is coming out from Zentrum and Jordan Mendeguccia in, um, in Spain. I think he is like the pelvis, that mm-hmm. pelvis and hamstring injuries, mm-hmm. how important that is. The more anterior tilted you are, the more risk you are of it being at injury. So more anterior tilt means more likelihood of getting a hamstring injury. Also, more neutral pelvis, quote unquote, means your mechanics are probably going to look a bit better or else you can or, or you can put better mechanics on top of that uh, that pelvis and that sprinting posture according to the world's best sprint coaches lifting my ribs up into the sky means my pelvis goes forward not being able to breathe and have a full excursion of my thorax mm. means i don't i can't rotate as well i can't i can't keep my pelvis in neutral so and and yet there's people debating that breathing is important mm. Mm. it just doesn't add up Mm. i don't care that you can't show me the research it's just mm. like i've just showed you the research there mm. so mm. that's a bit of a, a bit of a rant but like no 100 100 mate and you know we, we haven't talked much about the feet there but you know you give you give credit to the likes of um of gary ward now that's really i think opened up an understanding especially for for practitioners like i to look at a short course and go okay here's how you might want to manipulate mechanics there and, and back in you know alongside been the glute and throwing clamshells on everybody. I was I was rolling out plantar fascia, going, "Fucking ah, these guys feel fucking great." If we can get that plantar fascia to to move a little bit and then put them through some extensive routines, and then we go and do some intensive plyos or some sprints, and like, I fucking feel great. And and it, you know, along the way and through my own issues, you recognise how important big toe extension is, and how if you're not hitting that very well, you're probably not hip and rotating very well, and you are dumping into excessive extension. I mean, look at the guys who constantly have calf issues, hamstring issues, adductor issues, psoas problems. They are the guys who live in toes, mm-hmm. can't find you know, a neutral position, say more midfoot, quote unquote. And they struggle to decelerate and change direction effectively. And or the cost of doing extension, extension, extension all the time catches up with them because they get to a point where they're fucking really strong yeah. on hammies and everything else. But if you ask them to get stronger outside of their range, they're rubbish. They're terrible. No. You throw them all board, they seek extension straight away. Like yeah. that's their strength, isn't it? Yeah. And don't get me wrong. When I don't think either of us are going to say that extension's bad. It's not. But when you choose to um, perform or excel in that shape all the time, you certainly can't have uh, good enough qualities in in frontal and or mm-hmm. transverse plane. You can't. Mm-hmm. You can't because you're brought all the way into one and not the other. Yeah. And, and, and no, it's not that ex- it's it's actually it's actually the opposite. I value extension so much that I don't want someone to start there so they can go into extension. Exactly. <laughs> it's simple as that. Exactly. If you're just jammed there, there's nothing left. You've nothing left. I worked with um, in 2013 for, for three or four years some um, freestyle ski snowboards, and these are I, it's, we were talking about skill set of of performers earlier on in racing. These guys are exceptional. Like they're jumping off kickers over 25 foot in the air whilst rotating three times upside down and rotating about their axis three times and then landing a jump. But the, the challenge there is that they either land it and they, they get on a podium and get a medal or they fall and it's probably quite catastrophic <laughs> and they fracture something. They definitely get a concussion and maybe they're elated off a mountain. So the skill set that they need, not only to come in and have the right level of pretension 
and overcome inertia and yield that force as they come and ride out a, a, a landing. But to avoid their knee blowing out, like every athlete we had on the program had historically had an SEL. And or if you screen them, you thought you're probably the only way to get there. Now, how can you ever predict an SEL? I'm not saying you could. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a crystal ball or anything, but you looked at how they were set up, living on their toes, great quads, terrible hammies, glutes, tight lower back, and they constantly complain of tight lower back, constantly complain of uh, knee pain, anterior knee pain, because their quads are just on constantly, living in extension. And they get the job done, but if the demands of their season, such as travel, training, competition, started to exceed their capacity, their tolerance, problems arose. Problems arose. And or they just didn't feel, and it took them an injury to learn what good landing mechanics was like but they, just didn't, they didn't have that solid bite on. They're near a landing, ride it out, keep momentum without losing it, and then not be able to get the next height on the next kicker. Mm-hmm. And I did, my, um, I did my MPhil on the landing demands, and we did a, a comparison of, gosh, this is going back some now, but we looked at the um, we looked at time motion analysis of uh, change in angle and velocity of angle at the ankle, at the knee, uh, at the hip, and the, and the trunk as well, and looking at what of those body parts contributed to decelerating and landing. Um, we looked at muscle EMG as well, as well as accelerometry, so acceleration of landing. Um, and the ones who, who had, if you like, as a performer as well, were standout performers, landed the biggest tricks, always performed best at competition, were the ones who had the best movement options, like they could do it front side, back side, switch, regular, whatever. Um, so their skill set was right up there, but their landing mechanics was incredibly clean. Really good communication between torso, hip, knee, and ankle. And they would disperse that landing with a, a really nice, not 50-50, but a good at least 60 to 40 ratio of what we got on at quads, hammies with the ENGs that we did. Mm-hmm. Um, and they rarely got anterior knee pain and mm-hmm. or other issues or same meniscal issues because yeah, these they're just able to share well. the force across their body. 100%. So to say, like, that's, that's what, again, why people I get really frustrated. One of the most frustrating things is hearing people, he, hearing people say that biomechanics isn't important. And it's because there's so much load going through that one of those guys, when they, when they hit the floor, but like how I share the load is as important as how, how strong I am. Mm. And that's where you see guys who don't look particularly strong sometime. And, and they're just unbelievable at, at, the, the muscular coordination intra and inter like just spreading them and and the, the way they organize their body and how they can extend collisions and and all these things and mm. disperse force across all of their joints mm. there's no amount of strength that can stop there's no amount of distal quadriceps strength that can beat a landing like that like you can keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger but if you just keep landing in a way that's just putting all the stress through that one area, mm. you're, you're not going to survive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like and you need is... both. And you need, there is no doubt you need both. Mm. You need both. But and like, you, we, we, look, we, we would see an improvement upon skill on if you improve, say, someone's, you know, eccentric hamstring strength and or rate of force development eccentrically. Like we do a, a hell of a lot, especially in that sport, because their mm-hmm. job was, I need to jump, I need to land. And do it again and again and again. So we do a lot of depth landings with extenuated load or extenuated speeds, and that was fine. But you know, and they would look tidier, you know, more adept if you got them stronger in those positions. But absolutely, mm-hmm. you had to still coax and challenge and tease out. Let me know if we make that skill even crisper, we need to we need to get that skill as clean as possible because you're definitely not going to tolerate. I can't get you twelve times strong to your body mass. I can't build that that relative strength in you in the gym. So we're going to really, really hone in your skill set because if you look like shit, yet you're really strong, it doesn't matter because you just can't express that force very effectively. <laughs> so that, that, that was your damage limitation for sure. And it still is today. I think that's where a lot of the, the literature is going, obviously, and, and our journalists and those guys talk about deceleration as well. And they talk about that as importance for yeah. agility, not just, not just acceleration, but yeah. you know, don't overlook the decel. Yes, sir. Um, would you here's a theory I have 
I'm a Man United fan and they're just an absolute mess. I can't even I can't even watch them. They just wreck my head. Not even because not even because they're not winning. I don't really care that much. But they just the players annoy me. The, the the club annoys me. If I was to take over Man United in the morning, I would just go to Toto Wolf and put them in charge. Would I would I be right? <laughs> I know he might not have any experience with football, but he yeah. just seems like a man who would just figure it out and get shit sorted. Yeah. I think oh, listen, I, I don't know the guy. Um but That's your second uh, job. Find get, 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 get to know Toto and introduce me. I'm getting I'm getting there, mate. I'm getting there. I it's know, um, yeah. it's um look, I I, I oh, yeah, he's, he's an exceptional an exceptional leader clearly like you you don't manage that franchise and and have a a large ownership in that or a large stake in it if you're uh not somebody that okay you know you've got some understanding of the sport and a history but you can't lead people you can't influence behavior you can't inspire people to pull in a direction that is optimum for for the growth of a culture and environment and a car and Phenomenal guy, clearly. Like you know, you talk about other guys in uh, in Sir David Brailsford. Like, there's a reason why these guys are speaking to you know high end business CEOs, huge franchises. Because mm-hmm. you know, I guess what you're drawing on really is that those skills do transfer. Yeah, they do add value. Yeah, um, and I think if you if you clearly define it, and you can do so with at least at least a, a pretty good standing and a uh, and a CV that says that you've built good, high-performing teams. There's no reason why you can't add that value in another sport. And look, that's one of the things that I've I'm not walking around like a, a leader in all departments, but I've had a number of, of head of department roles in football and rugby and led programs in Olympic snow sports and other places. And and I've probably worked in about 15 different sports right now. Um, and I'd love the challenge of going from one to the next. Like no, my journey was a bit back and forth. It was never football for 10 years, then try rugby for a bit. It was always back and forth, but you'd always be looked upon as a Toto would now as what does this guy know about this sport? Mm-hmm. Surely you can't be like the amount of times I had that when I went from snow sport into back into rugby league. And those guys were like, what are you talking about, mate? How do, what do you know about rugby league? And you know, <laughs> you, and you don't, you, you're, like, you're there, you're going, listen, I'm not here to be a specialist in that sport. That's your job, mate. But what I am a specialist in understanding is how we get you to this place with this, this, this. What do you think about that? And they go, oh, yeah, that's, that's quite good, actually. Mm-hmm. So um, I think having enough, having enough uh, uh, empathy for what people do in an environment and helping them lead. Like I really like Alex Ferguson's thing of listen, learn, and lead. Gather as much as you can about an environment first. Understand the people, their problems, their motivations, um, uh, through listening and learning and then eventually you can lead because you've got enough insight and, uh, uh, and evidence to use or, or marry with what you do best yeah. so yeah. yeah I think Toe is a, a phenomenal guy mate yeah there's, um, there's, a few, there's a few really interesting characters I think in that space that, that would do very well in other sports for sure I'm telling you the level of detail in their teams and the people they've, and the money they're dealing with and all of these things I think I think he would be unbelievable. Did you listen to his high performance podcast? I did. That, yeah. I when, did. He, when they asked him at the end, there are three things for high performing life or something. And he, he goes, do not lie. Uh, always <laughs> tell the truth. Or so yeah, his three yeah. were all like, yeah. don't lie and do not bullshit me. Yeah. I was like, I would, I would head by the wall if you <sighs> asked me to go to. Like, you, 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 you mentioned it before. Like there's so many people in that space that, um, yeah, there's a few characters yeah you know, it's, it's a bit of a circus so you, mm-hmm. you can look at the charlatans a little bit and you, then you can see some other people that carry really good integrity they're authentic he's for sure one of them yeah. um just an impressive bloke and yeah yeah i heard that he was just like his review process what do you how do you review toto it's like oh i just look at myself in the mirror when i'm brushing my teeth and ask <laughs> if i've done the best i can today you think yeah that's a pretty simple strategy i can employ as well so yeah yeah he's he's exceptional mate yeah yeah when i heard that podcast and and another time then very closely around that time as well i heard jordan peterson as well saying something like don't lie like he was real clear on do not lie about anything like it mars your character you you when you look at yourself in the mirror you kind of know and i was like I, I, I was like i'm going to take that to heart not even not that i was going around lying but like 
just you know you might see a little white lie or something here or there and i i took i took that to heart and i'm like no i'm, I'm going to be very clear that mm. i don't i don't want I, actually it doesn't know lo, lo, it's not just lying but it's i'm going to be very trying to be very clear as, as clear as i can going forward that I don't I, anything that I could look in the mirror like no one else will know but anything I could look in the mirror and say that wasn't that, that probably wasn't right or whatever I'm just it's going to be so clear that I'm not doing it mm, mm, it, mm. it affects it affects it affects me it, it affects everyone I think but they don't realize it but I think it's such a oh mate and, and you know for for the reasons that a lot of us try and get into certain positions or open certain doors it's a small world isn't it and it's frightening how many people know you or know of you or know of your practice and and some of the aspects of your character and even if you had a, f- a bad first impression that still carries you on um you know i've been in like every role that i've i've had it has been because i either knew someone directly and or i knew someone who knew someone and there was an entry in there um so if you're ignorant to that you're probably shooting yourself in the foot and not doing yourself mm-hmm. uh, a, a good service but yeah, I think I, I really like that from that. Um, there was a Peter Schmeichel um, episode on the on the same podcast that you referred to before, and and he was talking. You know, they were talking about how do you how do you get that honesty in yourself? How do you remain accountable or responsible to to the direction that you're headed in and the right decisions that you're making on a regular basis? And he was talking about you know having some real non negotiables. One of those was a a tight group, so you're not in an echo chamber, but you're in a, a group of people that are diverse enough. To yeah. challenge you it's that whole high challenge high support yeah. i really like that you know yeah. my wife's in definitely in that group and i've got some other really close pals that have got different backgrounds they don't necessarily know each other but like like i'm sure you do you go to those people for advice or for a bit of a tough a tough word if you think you need it but you don't want to hear it and mm-hmm. and it's invaluable especially in what you and i do you know working for yourself trying to grow something from from nothing and, and i've got i get huge huge fear mate huge fear huge imposter syndrome about the direction that you're going in despite what you've been where you are and because it to the person you're going to meet tomorrow it doesn't matter because it's all about what you can demonstrate right now mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah i've i've felt i've probably felt isolated over the last couple of years just mm. not so much, i didn't notice it that much in the first year of covid because we were just plowing ahead like just getting just it's making sure, money yeah. just just yeah, just pushing ahead, like, and yeah. we were so busy, I didn't have time to even think and reflect. And then, yeah, I just realized yet recently that I probably have felt isolated from from that, like, from not from family or anything, or friends, but just from having that maybe little group of people or something that keeps me accountable, or you mm. know, just having a chat, like, mm. like, like this chat, I suppose, that type of thing. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I constantly try and come back to it's probably in the past in the past year or so in, and one of the things I was talking about with a, a collab earlier with career blueprint is I think a lot of a lot of coaches or not even just coaches but a lot of people will make decisions based like for a role for instance like all the moves I tried to make I don't mind saying were about career development personal development opportunity credibility to some extent money it was if you if you really think about it there were job focused decisions that if you if you will they're underpinned by ego and insecurity and then if you flip that and go okay well those things are great and you you might romanticize about the opportunity especially the first year in but you very quickly realize that you've got yourself in an environment that maybe the environment the people the projects that you're doing don't quite marry with who you are and what you're about and i've had that a couple of times and you know people call it chasing the badge and then you realize that okay how does this really align with who I am as a person? What makes me happy, fulfilled? Does that speak to my values as a person? Mm-hmm. And it's not until, you know, I was in my thirties and then we started to have a family and you start to really, I think, scrutinize the fruits of your labor and the value of your time that you go, fuck, time's my greatest asset. And I'm spending it over here and have done for the past decade of getting, getting to a good point. But is that sustainable for me? It, Cause it, I think you either, you either go impact or sustainability in any move you're making. And for me, largely, it's about growing an impact of a brand now, but sustainability of that to say, that's me for the next couple of decades, whatever it might be left of me. And am I living a life that's congruent with who I, who I am and who I want to be? 
and who I want my family to see I am and what I can do for them? Or am I doing it for, for the, the status, the standing of, of oh, I want to be working at this level? Because there's, there's always a cost, but I guess coming back to the point of being authentic to who you really are and not just following the Joneses and being prepared to stand out, even if you think that, you know, that's not, that's not an avenue that the status quo go in or your peer group are, are comfortable with, but you're prepared to go against the grain and, and take that path less trodden. It, it takes a lot of bravery to do that, I think. But yeah. Yeah. coming back to, to what you're about. Yeah. Last question for you. Three coaches. Tr- no, 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 you're not. You don't get to, you don't, you don't necessarily have to pick coaches. You don't get to, you can if you want. Three coaches or three people on a desert island with you for a week. Who are you bringing? Not family. I wish I thought about this. I know you've asked, asked this before. Oh, you must have listened to a podcast. I have li- I've listened to a couple, mate. I've listened yeah. to a couple. What's your favourite? Um, who, well, I'll tell you what I've listened to so far. I listened to Kia. I listened to... Um, oh, I listened to the last one. Graham Morris. Listen listened yeah. to him as well. Um, yeah, that's what I've listened to so far, I think. That's it. So you need to, put, you need to brush up. I need to do... I need to brush up. Um, who, who, who would I take? takeaways... Or oh, no, mate. no, no, I don't care about takeaways. Any tips for me? Any tips? No, listen, I think you're doing a phenomenal job. I think that it's hard to do this. I often think about, you said this to me a while ago, you should yeah. do a podcast. Yeah. The world doesn't need another podcast, but then I yeah, think... But they, they, yeah, but you're in the wrong, you're in a competition mindset there. Yeah, exactly. John exactly. Noonan doesn't have a podcast. There's it's, no John Noonan exactly. podcast. So the, put you, put this market doesn't exist. One. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, 100%. So, but I know your lifestyle is like, if you're traveling stuff, it's going to be very hard. Yeah, but I, it's all about prioritizing, isn't it? And, and, and I think going, well, if there's a value to it, then it's, it's worth it's worth mm-hmm. that value spent. But mm-hmm. um, if you're looking to get your message out there, mm-hmm. and I know Instagram doesn't always suit you because it's a little bit short and you're not yeah. trying to be too flashy. So I know that doesn't, it, 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 it can, it definitely can, but like, it's not, it's not always the best option. I think sometimes, especially for what you're trying to convey, it's not always the best option. Mm. Um, a podcast is like anyone who anyone who's interested in marketing and marketing a good message, like putting it out there. Podcast is serious. I think I know. Look, I'm what seven episodes in, but I think a podcast is a serious. It's never going to go away. It's it's there forever. Exactly, exactly. It's it's building the content behind the brand and. I know you've, uh, I have listened to your other message about, your other podcast about um, your social media strategy. I, I thought that was clever from you to do that. And, and it, but in that, you make the point about not just living on the Instagram, despite the fact that it brings a lot of attraction for you and, and you do a great job with it, but having something else and your email list being huge to you and the rapport that you build with your client base. And that's you know important for, for your wealth. But it, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably in that place at the minute of going, how do I speak to my audience better? And how do yeah. I get a bit more traction on Instagram? And I see, you see the hours that you, you and, 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 uh, and your partner must put into, to the gram. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of investment there, but, um, getting back to your point, I think that you can't, you can't get it across on Twitter posts. You can't get it across Instagram posts. You can maybe get a lot of it out on, on your email market and stuff, but I don't know. I don't know the success rate. Yeah, but how do you get yeah. someone on? On no, you do. You, your email marketing gets like balloons in success mm. when they trust you and they've listened to you and they've consumed your material. So like your email, it's it's all about your funnel, like how you get people there. So my funnel is no, I won't give that away. I, I'll do a solo episode on that. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Maybe good, I good. won't. No, I'll do it for good. my members there. People need to go and sign up. There um, you go. Uh, get in the plug right no come on three yeah three who, who am i taking well you've mentioned one already i think toto wolf would be oh yeah yeah me too he, he'd be i'm coming phenomenal. as well then he'd be phenomenal mate yeah you, you can come as the fourth you can you can you can you won't get the dinghy though he'll um oh no you've been the digging we've been the boat he'd be uh he'd be there david brailsford i think he'd be a really interesting character uh, and again it's along the same sort of vein but we've mentioned it before sir alex ferguson like yeah. watching watching the dynamic between those guys as well would be phenomenal yeah um, but just impressive guys and, and i think there's like just like my head's going really broad less less into a certain discipline these days and i think i'm more bothered these days about i'm growing as a person not just a professional as well those, those three people show like show where your mind is at at the moment yeah yeah that's very true yeah. they're <laughs> all like kind of yeah 
heads of organization type of people who are like trying to organize everything Business underneath them. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, mate. Well rounded, probably. Hmm? Who are you taking? I don't know. Toto. I don't know. I actually haven't thought of it, my answer. You're not allowed to ask me. That's poor from you. Toto. I'll just bring Toto. This <laughs> <laughs> is a week with Toto. And, and maybe maybe Max and Lewis to watch that watch that unfold in front of you. Who uh who who obviously you were a Lewis man then? I, 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 no, you I have to say that now. I want I wanted him to win, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um we, we were there. Max. We, we we just finished the because we, we rest at the same weekends as the Formula One. And yeah. it's like, you don't appreciate it on TV. Cause it's just a schedule, right? One's on, one's off. And you've got the Porsche GT racing there sometimes. Even the Women's Series racing there sometimes. And it's, there's all, it's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, and we just finished and we were sat in the stands. And um, we, we, we <laughs> obviously, like, the facade of what happened at the end of the, end of the race was incredible, right? You know, we were watching it. And I, I had the view of they just come around the marina and that crash had happened with the Tifi, and you had the four or five cars between Lewis and Max, and suddenly the calls obviously come through mm-hmm. and nothing at the time, but they've all broken off, and the place just fell silent. There was a buzz, and it was it was like this eerie silence. You could hear people going, "What's going on? Mm-hmm. That why?" And then suddenly, obviously, no one else came through like you generally would see if a call like that gets made. And before you knew it, I thought, even before the restart, everyone knew Lewis is not on tires. It was never going to happen for the guy. Yeah, Max was going to, yeah, yeah. And that was yeah, it. And yeah. that was it. And you saw on the straight as they came back around the arena, Lewis have that little bite back at him and just... Yeah. Unbelievable. Max, Max pull away. Mate, it was not. Oh, that is going to go down in history as one of the greatest sporting moments of all time. Yeah. I, honestly. And one of the most controversial as well. You could sure. not have written it. It was... Yeah. Fucking unbelievable. I yeah. was screaming. I was like calling Kira's arm. I was having a bit of a like a seizure standing up. And then like I I want I just wanted Max to win all season because he was yeah. the underdog, but like I appreciate Lewis is just but I felt sorry for Max as well because like it, if that's your first time, you want to be able to just like embrace that moment. And yeah. you probably couldn't, you know. It was a little bit of a of... yeah. oh, sure. one. My speaker just went. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. All right. Okay, we'll leave it there. Yeah, we... no problem, mate. I'm sure you've got enough content there, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> I'm gone for long. Mate, I enjoyed that. Nah, it's a good chat. It's a good chat. We, um, what was I going to say? So, get me in the thing, the sim. Get you in the sim. Get me on the island with Toto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, where can people find you? What do you? Where do you want them to go? Uh, yeah, I mean, social media is all the same. John Noonan Coach, all one word. Uh, there's a lot of N's and O's in there, but you'll 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 get it. Um, website Noonan Performance isn't very lively, but that's there's a, there's a plan to shift that on this year as well. So, yeah, probably primarily socials, mate. Initially, yeah, cool. yeah, okay. Send me a bio and a headshot. I'll give you. We we'll never do. did an intro for you, so I'll have to do an intro beforehand. Okay, no problem. I'll do it at least eight hundred jobs. <laughs> Sam, mate, yeah, no, I'll do that. I'll do that. Outstanding. <laughs>